Jenny Kleeman traveled along the Mediterranean coast to investigate a threat to some of the country's spectacular historical treasures. Turkey is full of ancient Greek and Roman ruins, like these at Perge. Entire towns and cities are preserved, giving us unique insights into the ancient world. So this is the theater of Perge. Wow. <laughs> this is really something. One of Perge's head archaeologists, Inji Delaman, showed me around. It's a huge theater. How many people could sit and, and what about 10 or 15,000 at the most? As I many think. as 15,000. At least seven different civilizations have settled here over thousands of years, from Neolithic times through to the Greeks, Romans, and Persians. Archaeologists are only just beginning to piece together their stories. But it's not easy when some of the most important artifacts, which have lain undisturbed for centuries, seem to be slipping through their fingers. This lower fragment uh, was found in the Roman baths and the upper part of the statue is in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Yes, and there's just a photograph. How did it end up in Boston? Well, it was smuggled. It was smuggled? Yes, it was smuggled. So archaeologists have never seen the entire complete statue? No. No? No. And uh, the Turkish government has made negotiations, but uh, it's not returned yet. What happened to the statue of Hercules is not a one-off. Many pieces of Turkey's history have been looted and illegally exported, often ending up in museums and auction houses in Europe and North America. And here, most parts of the sarcophagus was found in Istanbul, in a truck. And these short size, both short size, were spotted in Germany. So it would have been taken apart, mm -hmm. some parts in Istanbul and yes, other parts uh -huh. in Germany. And this one here was uh, at the Getty Museum in the States. Archaeologists claim that in the past, some institutions in the West have driven the smuggling trade by not checking the source of their artifacts closely enough. And while the objects never lose their power to awe, if we don't know where they've come from, they become historically worthless. With booty fetching millions of dollars, this real-life treasure hunt attracts international crime gangs and professional plunderers, as well as opportunistic locals. Every theft is a potential loss to our understanding of human history. But guarding hundreds of rambling sites across the country is a tough task for the government. Ibrahim Choban's job is to stop Perge's most valuable tombs from being raided. He's a worried man. This is a dangerous job. My life's at risk. The looters don't come empty-handed. They're armed. I don't have anything. Do you think there's a lot of looting going on around Perge? Yes, it's happened before. For example, my own cousin's involved in this. His house is just there. So you're saying there's a known looter living just in that house over there, right next to the site? I'm constantly face to face with him here. We're at the brink of a trigger at any moment. We can become enemies, but I still report him to the necessary authorities. No wonder Ibrahim was worried. His cousin Adnan is a convicted murderer. I went next door to see if he would talk to us. 
people have told us that you are looting things and selling them on the black market and that police have investigated you for that. Is that true? I told the police I'd been digging. If you say you didn't do it, you get a bigger punishment. You can't fool the judge. But Adnan denies he was digging for profit. So why would you dig if not to sell? I was curious. I dug. He took me to see where his curiosity had paid off. And you can't help but think that underneath every mound here there might be something. I excavated the statue here. And another piece of it should be buried over there somewhere. It was just under three meters in height and weighed three tons. In this case, Adnan handed over the huge statue to the local museum, but the reward money wasn't to his satisfaction. They gave me a hundred lira. I went to dinner with three friends and it wasn't enough to cover the meal. I had to pay from my own pocket. But if you know that there are people who are prepared to buy this sort of thing from you, isn't it tempting when you find something that big to sell it to them? It is. But I don't do that right now. If I wanted, I could sell it in the most beautiful way. It wouldn't be a problem. It's obvious that he thinks there's nothing really wrong with looting treasures from Perge. And as long as there are people who share the same belief, Turkey's history is going to be plundered for profit. For the next stage of our journey, I headed east to another of the country's most famous landmarks, at the very heart of Anatolia. Turkey is a country full of surprises, but the skyline of Cappadocia has to rate as one of the most incredible. Every morning, dozens of visitors take to the skies to soar over another world. It's an amazing landscape around us. These conical formations of volcanic rock. They call them fairy chimneys. You can see why. It's a magical, prehistoric place where early residents made their very own fairy tale homes. You can see the, uh, there's a cave down there that's been hollowed out over there. If you can just make it out, the blackness in the rock. Humans first started carving out these homes thousands of years ago. And there are still communities of cave dwellers living in this area. This is my grandparents' property, and uh, we take over from my grandparents, mm -hmm. and now my parents are using there. Ah. Rafiq Chifchi, who now runs a local restaurant, grew up in these caves. And he's my father. Merhaba. His name is Hassan. Let me meet Hassan. Hello. Hello. Merhaba. My mother. Hello. And my wife Aisha. All right. This is beautiful. So this is the main bedroom in the house, is that right? Yes, yes. Your roots, where your family is from, is very much from the caves. But you live in a house now. Yeah, I do. But the reason is, I mean, my wife, she is a modern lady, you understand? Your wife is? Yeah, right. my wife is a modern lady. For her, is living in a cave is a bit, you know, funny. <laughs> because she didn't grow up here. Do you miss living in the caves? Yeah, of course I do, because if you say, well, I grew up here. I, I used to climb around these rocks like a fox in that time I was a kid. So you've, you've managed to bring us as far as we can go. This, this amazing view, wow. 
It's, that is an ancient, ancient view. The urban elite in Istanbul and many Europeans have long looked down on Anatolia as a rural backwater. And some people here do still live a traditional lifestyle. But things are changing. Just a few miles from Cappadocia, an economic revolution is transforming Anatolia. Towns in the area have been turned into billion dollar export centers. They call them Anatolian Tigers. In this one city, Kayseri, a thousand factories churn out machinery, furniture, clothing and electrical goods that are shipped all over the globe. Look at the size of this place. Your factory is huge. Over 20 years, Mehmet Feliz has built his family's refrigeration firm into a $15 million business with customers in 50 countries. Why do you think businesses in Kayseri have been so successful? Kayseri people are really very devoted to their religion. It's a community which really lives their Islamic values. If a businessman is a good Muslim, it definitely affects his business life. Kayseri businessmen invest a lot into their businesses. They don't really spend money on superfluous things. Mahmoud might be a devout Muslim, but he's now one of the world's largest suppliers of hotel minibars. Because you are a conservative Muslim, do you think there's any irony in the fact that you're producing, manufacturing minibars? I don't think there's an irony. I don't really care what's cooled in here. My job is to produce coolers. The emergence of the Anatolian Tigers has created a new business powerhouse at the center of the country, run by conservative Muslims. At the business park's dedicated mosque, instead of a factory tea break, 10,000 workers take a prayer break. Men like these now make up the core support of the country's ruling party, the AKP. The country's president is himself from Kayseri. But even with a pro-Islamic party in government, conservative Muslims aren't having it all their own way. In the Turkish capital, Ankara, Adil Ray has been examining one of the most divisive issues in Turkey. Mercan Yusel is in her final year at one of Turkey's top universities. She's shopping for back-to-school essentials. How do you decide what kind of hairstyle is then appropriate? We don't prefer this one or these ones because it's very um, fashionable. So too fashionable. We don't need fashion. Too, too trendy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We don't need to seem beautiful. So you're looking for the ugliest wig? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Merjan's a devout Muslim. She considers a headscarf a vital part of her outfit. But because it's seen as a religious symbol under Turkey's secular constitution, she's not allowed in university buildings while wearing it. So she's going to bizarre lengths to get around this ban. So Merjan, tell me why have you chosen this particular wig? Because this is long and okay. this will uh, hide my scarf. This will satisfy the... Uh, University. So it's a simple case, if, if you don't put this on now, you can't get a university education? Yes, that's true. That must be a really difficult thing to do. Yes, yes. You feel like a clown. The ban on headscarves is the most powerful symbol of the struggle between conservative Muslims and secularists for the very soul of Turkey. The pro-Islamic government tried to reverse it and was overruled by the secular courts. The ban means many devout women like Merjan feel they're being denied an education.